reward our good works, and God will remember that forever, and the good works will stay for eternity. So the Bible says that our good works will follow us forever. So that's good news. That is grace. Okay. But why? Why do people? Many people they just seems that they are not aware of the consequences of sin, because people just don't think. They they think that they can run away from God's eyes, even though they believe in Jesus. At the same time, they say, "I cannot run away from my sin. I I, I cannot avoid my sin. Therefore, I continue to sin." They give excuses and don't think of that we have to face God. Now, actually, you when you listen, when you look at your life, do you face God? Do you think of that our whole life we have to face God all the time? Now, after I'm experienced. Uh, I feel the ex- infilling of the Holy Spirit. I, I really become aware of that, that a whole life will be revealed to the whole world. So I pay attention to that, okay. But many people don't. And then reminder and warning. If a Christian's life is full of lies and full of anger, frustration, and lust, adultery, now. Then a lot of his works is nothing, is wasted. A lot of his efforts is wasted. Even when he serves God, if when he serves God, he look for power, look for money. He serves God, but at the same time, he serves his own need. Now it's not wrong for a pastor to receive salary, but there are pastors who just look for money. I have, you know, worked with. Pastor in Africa, and they、um, lied to me, and they used the money for their own purpose. And after I knew that knew it, I told them, "You have to face the judgment of God. You must repent." But there was one pastor that I know, actually a bishop. He refused to acknowledge that. He refused to admit his sins, and he think that he can avoid God's eyes. That's terrible. You know, he might have excuses and say, "I've done many good things for God. I've brought people to Christ. I've built a church." But at the same time, he is stealing money. He is lying. And and this pastor refused to admit his faults and. I feel sorry for him. I told him a number of times. You know, you're not cheating me. You're cheating God, and you have to face God. And he doesn't、uh, doesn't repent. And this is terrible. This is terrible. So it's a warning that some people could lose salvation. Now some people might just be barely saved. A lot of the works will be nothing if we in vain. But there are some. Who will not have salvation because they don't have the living faith at all? They just want to, you know, serve God for money. They just do it for money, not for because of the faith of, in God. That the the faith is not living, and they are living in sin, and that is terrible. So that's a warning. So how? When we know these passages, how do we live? First, we convince ourselves right now at this moment, what I'm thinking is revealed to the whole world and is revealed to God instantly. God knows our heart at this moment. If we don't have the heart to follow God, God sees it right away, immediately. God sees it already, right now, and we cannot run away from Him. So, we think of right now. Every thought of mine, every secret sin of mine, is revealed to God, and God sees it and knows it. So then we repent and say, "Lord, please forgive me, and please forgive me. I, in the past, I've done many things wrong. Please forgive me and wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. Help me to, to really be sorry for my sin and turn away from my sin, and that we'll obey you, we'll、uh, follow you, and serve you." Now, so, so that's the attitude. Saying, everything in my life will be revealed to God and to the whole world. Therefore, I will be very careful how I live. 
that I will watch my thoughts. When I'm helping someone, do I have impatience? Now, even sometimes it's passive. I mean, uh, we are affected by a person, so we have impatience or frustration or anger. These are sins also. So we we'll watch this and we say, Lord, I am having frustration. I'm, I'm not patient with people. I'm not kind with people. I say things that hurt people. Please, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive my sins. So be, we become aware of that. And we ask God to forgive us. And then we ask God to help us to change. At the same time, we pay attention to the work of the Holy Spirit to motivate us to love God and to be holy. So we pay attention to that and we thank God for that, the work of the Holy Spirit to motivate me to obey God. And then I say, Lord, help me to respond to the Holy Spirit, to love you, to obey you, to serve you. And then God, you'll be happy. So I can say to myself, oh, I am trying to obey God. I am trying to have a pure heart. I'm trying to have a heart of compassion and kindness and goodness. And God is happy with that. So I'm, I can be happy with myself. I can rejoice because I'm trying to be holy. I'm trying to care about people. I want to care about people. I really sincerely want to help people. Then we can thank God for that. So I hope that we have this attitude that I want to please God. And at the same time, when I please God, I can be happy with that. Now, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. But when I try to follow God, God is already happy. When I give a cup of water out of love, God will reward us. So I'm happy for that, even when I give a cup of water. Even when I help someone spiritually, when I pray for someone, when I'm kind to someone, I can say, it's God who works in my life to change me so that I will want to help people. Then we thank God for that. So this is how we build on, build on this positive attitude. That we want to have more positive attitude more heart of holiness and, and care and love for people. And then we say, thank God, you're working in my life and I'm responding to you and you are happy with me and you reward me. So that is a positive attitude and say, God, I'm happy to be following you, obeying you, and you'll be happy with me all day long. And all the days of my life, you'll be happy with me. Now this way, then we can live a joyful life. So this passage, a, outwardly, is a law passage that we can put in the grace of God. That is God who changes my life so that I want to live a holy life, so that I want to love people and care about people. So I thank God for that and I respond to that. So always look at the work of God in our lives. God is working in my life. So I look at that work and I appreciate God appreciate Him for moving in my heart. And then my heart is out of, you know, we, I love you, I love God with a pure heart. I serve God with a pure heart. And God is very happy with that. And it's God who produces this. So I appreciate God for that. And I want to serve God and love God. And I want to be happy every day because I'm obeying God. This way, any Law passage can be a motivation for us to say, okay, this passage reminds me of my sins, but the, when I, I'm aware of my sins, God is re talking to me, reminding me of my sin, reminding me to repent. And then when I repent, God is very, very happy. And it's God who changes me. And when I repent, God will, uh, is happy with me and He'll reward me when I obey Him. And so I can praise God for that and I can rejoice in that. So any law statement, we can change it. At the same time, we have the law part. At the same time, we have the grace part to motivate us to obey God. Now, let me use this passage um, that uh, do not give the devil a foothold. Now, this passage is a law statement. Do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let Satan attack us. So how can we use this to, uh, method to preach about this passage? That first, that we explain 
giving the devil a foothold because the passage talk about that do not be angry to the sunset uh, so that we don't want to stay in anger we don't want to have sin while if we have any kind of anger we don't have want to have sin so interpret the passage and then also when we sin we give the devil a foothold and examples there are people who give the devil a foothold all the time they they commit adultery they uh, they they have anger they have they hurt people they steal money and then they let Satan steal from them because then people lose trust in them they would have a bad reputation and the, their family will be destroyed the church ministry will be destroyed and people don't like them and God doesn't like the person and this person loses everything so there are people like that that live following the sins and give the devil a foothold and then God's nature and grace now here is just talk about the devil so what is what does this verse reveal us about God so when it talks about the devil you want to look at the opposite side okay sins will give the devil a foothold and he will steal from us and God is the one who preserves our heart so that we will not give the devil a foothold so the opposite that we don't have a f foothold to the devil because God works in my heart so I will obey God so I will listen to God I will serve God I will take care of my sins and then God is happy with me and I don't give the devil a foothold and I don't have to be afraid of the attack of Satan you know there are many people who talk about the attack of Satan and I tell them that that Jesus has given us authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and there's nothing that can hurt us that we don't have to be afraid so then I say that okay I have the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to, on the devil I don't have to be afraid of the devil when I have a close relationship with God and I take care of all my sins that I you know take care of sins of my life now some people might say it's too hard to take care of sins now the key to take care of the sins in our life is I have a five step to victory five step to victory okay is first aware of my sins now I'm switching to this passage do not give the devil a foothold and how to overcome sin some people say it's too hard and I say first become aware of the sins and second believe that all sins are destructive third what does the Bible say the Bible tells us to live a holy life to be holy as the Father is holy four pray for forgiveness and strength and five choose to obey for instance we are, are having anger we are aware that we have anger and it's destructive and then the Bible says that sin if we have no uh, sin you know that we don't sin even when we have anger now, of course we want to avoid anger except for holy anger but then you know uh, hardly do people have holy anger because a lot of times it's mixed with personal anger and then number four that we are sorry for my sins and ask God to forgive us and give us strength and then I choose to say if people hurt me it's their problem and God will be after them so I don't have to be angry with them and if I'm angry with them then I fall into sin so I say I choose not to be affected by them I choose to pray for them because they have been hurt by other people so they have anger I choose to bless them I choose to forgive them I choose to put down my anger so I don't live in anger I choose to be peaceful I choose to praise God so I have I I'm not in anger and I believe that people cannot steal from me cannot take away the good things of God so I don't have to be angry if people try to hurt me so that's the way to overcome the sin of anger now if it's lust when we are aware of lust then we say it's destructive and then I say that what does the Bible say we live a holy life and then we honor our marriage and other people's marriage and then four we ask God to forgive us and give us strength and five 
I choose to obey. I choose to put away the lust. I choose not to look at the sexy woman. I choose to think about the holiness of God. I choose to believe that lust is destructive. So I choose to think about God and turn away from the, the lust, not uh, knowing that lust is destructive. Lust will open a way for the devil to steal from me. And also lust will cause God to be unhappy with me and it will take away the blessings of God. So we choose not to commit our sins. Now, if I use an example, if the whole world is watching us, can we stop our lust right then? If the whole world, or if just a group of people around us seeing that we have lust, can we stop it? Yes, we can stop it. We say, wow, everyone is looking at me. I know they know what I'm doing and thinking. So I want to keep my heart so that I live in holiness and not live in sin. And then we can choose to obey God when we have a strong enough motivation. And one day we'll all be standing in front of God. All our sins will be revealed to the whole world, to the angels and all, to all people. Then we'll say, I don't want to be in shame. All my sins are revealed to the whole world. All my lust is revealed to the whole world. I want to put that down. Now every time we commit any kind of lust in secret, we can think of the roof as being open and the whole world is watching and God is watching. Everyone is watching because on the last day, on the judgment day, every day of our life will be revealed to God. God will show us this is what you do in secret and God will show our sin and then at that time we'll be, you know, if God shows our sin, we'll say we'll be very shameful and then will say, I wish I can go back to the moment I can stop that lust, lust right away. So now we can think of in the future, one day my sins will be revealed to the whole world and I want to keep myself holy and ask God to forgive me right now and choose to obey God. Now many people continue to sin because they don't think sins are destructive and they don't think God is watching and they don't think the whole world is watching. But the whole world is watching. So the warning is that, you know, when we continue to live in sin, it is very destructive. And then how? How is to, res to treasure our life? We are, tr we are precious. God makes our life precious. Now remember, I talk about four motivations. First, God is full of love and power. Second, God treasures us. God loves us. Third, when we love God, obey God, serve God, and live a holy life, God is very happy and He will bless us. Four, if we don't serve God, we don't love God, we don't have a close relationship with God, then and when we live in sin, there's always destructiveness. So we see that nobody can run away from God. Everyone, our life will be revealed to God. So I want to obey Him, I want to serve Him, I want to follow God, and then God will be very happy. So that's how then we know that our whole life will be revealed to God. And uh, that we'll, when we sin, we, we uh, give a foothold to the devil. And this is destructive. And Satan will come to steal, kill, and destroy. Therefore, I pray to God for forgiveness <laughs> and strength. And then I choose to stop the sin so that the devil cannot put a foothold, that I don't give the devil a foothold to step into my, my heart, that I don't give the devil a chance to step into my heart. So that's how uh, I change it to grace, that God is working in my life. The grace, a lot of time, is what God does in my heart. He changes my heart. He works in my heart. He gives me a new nature so that I want to obey God, so that I want to love God, so I want to live a holy life. And when I do that, it's God working in my life. And when I obey God, then God is very happy and God will reward me. So then any passage, a law passage, I can change it to uh, uh, that it contains both 
law and grace. To give the devil a foothold, the law is that when we give the devil a foothold, it will give the devil the chance to attack us, to steal from us. And then the grace part is God will work in our heart so that we have the motivation to love God and live a holy life. And it's God who is working in my life, so I want to obey Him. I want to let God continue to work in my life so that I live a holy life. And God is happy with that. And God will bless me. So, I hope you all understand that. Any passage, we can look at the positive side. Look at what God does to help us avoid that sin. Look at how God works in our heart so that we'll have victory in that sin. And God is very happy when we have victory over, to overcome the sins and not to give the devil a foothold. So any kind of law passage, you can add in the grace at the same time. That way, when we preach, people would feel there is a chance to overcome the sins. There is strength to overcome the sins. We don't have to give in to the sins. We can have victory. And we can be joyful when we have victory. And right now, we can choose to say no to the sin and have victory. So this way, then we will always have um, a positive side, the grace side, to motivate people. Okay, now, um, we just look at Revelation 2.23. And now Ephesians 2 1. This is um, a complicated passage. And uh, we will go over time a little bit because uh, actually we didn't start on time today. So make up the time. Ephesians 2 1. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, so this passage talks about God made us alive when we were dead in trespasses and sins. So this passage talks about, now I'm interpreting the passage. This passage talks about that Christians before we were saved, that we lived and we were dead in sins. We were dead spiritually in sins. In which we once walked, we once walked in the sins according to the course of this world, according to the way of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The spirit who now works in the sons of the disobedience uh, is the evil spirit. So we walk according to the prince of the power of the air. So we follow the prince of the power of the air, follow Satan and the, and the uh, evil spirit. Uh, now, so that was before we were saved. Uh, that all Christians, all people, when they were dead in sins, were following Satan and the devil and, uh, and the demons. Okay, among whom also we all once conducted. Uh, let's go back to this. So it says that all non Christians now have the evil spirit working in the, in the hearts. Now it doesn't mean they are, are filled with evil spirit. Some, some non Christians are filled with the whole evil spirit. Filled with the evil spirit means that even the body is controlled by the demons. That the, the the body, the thinking, the talking is controlled by the demons. Not all non Christians are like that. But all Christians are under the influence of the evil spirit. 
that the evil spirit is working in the heart. But some people are controlled by the demons to a greater extent that they are controlled physically. The body and the speech and the thinking are controlled by Satan. So, that, so we know that all non-Christians have the evil spirit. And we'll look in a moment where the Christians also have this evil spirit influencing us. Okay, So the spirit now works in a sense of disobedience uh, among whom also we all were once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. So once we lived according to the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So at that time we followed the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And uh, we're, so at that time we were following the lust and were by nature children of wrath. So the non-Christians are children of wrath. They are under the wrath of God, just as the others. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So while we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive. Okay, so this passage talks about that uh, Christians, before we were converted, we were dead in sins and God made us alive. So it's God who changed our heart. And then, uh, we, at that time, we were influenced by the evil spirit. And some people uh, were filled with the evil spirit. Now, the question I have, we have here, we study the passage that non-Christians, uh, they follow the evil spirit. The evil spirit are influencing them. Now the question I have is, all Christians before they were converted were influenced by the evil spirit. How about after they are converted? Do all Christians immediately turn away from the evil spirit? Do all Christians immediately obey God totally? And the influence of the evil spirit is not there? Now we see that even Peter, he denied Jesus three times and also told Jesus not to be crucified and Jesus said to him Satan get behind me so he was talking to Satan working through Peter so even Peter had the evil spirit working inside him influencing him but he was not filled with the evil spirit the evil spirit was just influencing his thought and his words so even Christians are influenced by evil spirit now, some Christians are influenced to a greater extent. We can see some Christians, they always get angry, they always get frustrated, have depression, have lust, and they always think about getting married, and they cannot get married, and they are very frustrated, and they are very unhappy. They are Christians like that. And there are Christians who cause, causes, to cause fights in the church, that they fight with the people in the church. They are not... Uh, they don't show love. They show, they show uh, anger and frustration. They're fighting with people. So we see Christians like that. So they were controlled by the evil spirit before they were saved. So after they were saved, does the evil spirit still control them, influence them? So we see that actually many Christians are influenced by the evil spirit. So some people say, oh, you're a Christian, so uh, you're not influenced by the evil spirit. But we look at, at before we were saved, that all Christians were influenced by the evil spirit. So after they're saved, depends on whether they build up a strong relationship with God and submit to God. If they don't, then the influence of the evil spirit is still with them. And we can see that very real. And even in the Bible, it talks about that that Peter was used by Satan to tell Jesus not to be crucified. And we see that Ananias and Sapphira, they, they lied to the church when they sold the house, but then they didn't give all the money to the church, but they just gave some. Now they can, they can just say, okay, I kept some of the money. That's fine, but they did not. They, they said that, that you know, it's all the money. So they were lying. So they were influenced by the evil spirit. And Thomas too, at one point he loved the world. 
So, and then he left uh, Paul. So it happens to Christians. And in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches also talk about the sins of the Christians there. So Christians are influenced by the evil spirit to a certain extent for each person. I would say this, okay, this is God, right hand, and the left hand is the evil spirit. When a Christian is controlled by God all the time, then the work of the, Holy, the evil spirit is very low. That once in a while, the evil spirit still brings in thoughts to try to cause the Christians to stumble. But when the Christians have a close relationship with God, he will become aware of that. Now, but still, some Christians who are strong, like David, he was strong, but at one point he was very low. Suddenly, Satan has a way to attack. So Satan can attack anytime, even when we are strong. But if we keep this relationship very strong all the time with God, then Satan will have no way that as soon as Satan talks to us, then immediately the presence of God will remind us that Satan is talking to us. And then we can respond to the evil spirit and say, Satan, go away from me and stop the sin. But this is not all, you know, not all Christians are like that. Not all Christians are aware of their sins. Not all Christians are aware that the evil spirit are trying to attack them. That they have very low awareness. That's why in the five steps of victory, I have first awareness. Awareness of our sin. And then it's destructive. And then what does the Bible tell us to do? And then pray for forgiveness and strength. And then five, choose to obey the five steps to victory. So, when we are aware of the, any kind of sinful thoughts, actually that is put there by the Satan and also by our own sinful nature. Whenever we have any kind of anger and lust and greed and frustration or depression, whenever we have any kind of sinful thoughts, whenever we dislike someone, whenever we cannot forgive someone, it's coming from our sinful nature and coming from the evil spirit. And then when we are aware of that, then we can stop it. Now, if we have the motivation, some people are aware of that and then they'll say, ah, just let me stay in sin for a while, I'll repent later. They think that it's okay to repent later. Now, let me say this, when we repent later, God will still forgive us, but the sin has destructiveness. It will bring destruction to our life because Jesus said to the man uh, who was healed after 38 years of of sickness, Jesus said to him, sin no more lest the worst thing will happen to you. So when we sin, the worst thing will happen to us. For instance, if a person yell at another person, then it would influence the relationship. It would influence his reputation, influence his ministry. So any kind of sin, even in a thought, even when we have anger, frustration, unforgiveness, or lust in the thought, it will affect our relationship with God, affect our spiritual life. So any kind of sin staying in our heart is destructive. So when we understand that, then we have the motivation. If I obey God now, God will bless me and will, will raise up my life to a high level and help me to enter God's plan. But if I don't obey God now, when I sin, then it will bring destruction to my life. So that awareness, and believing that any sins cannot escape God's eyes, then we'll keep our life being alert to obey God. Okay, so I'm interpreting this passage that even Christians can face the temptation of the evil spirit, and many Christians actually are controlled by the evil spirit to a certain extent. There are some Christians who go to church, but at the same time they commit adultery or have anger or frustration, uh, and greediness, all kinds of sins. So there are Christians who at the same time he goes to church, but at the same time he is committing sins. He will repent sometimes, and then, but sometimes he will allow himself to stay in sin. So that happens. So we become aware of that, that yes, that is possible. And now, so we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, and fulfill the desires of the flesh of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So when we sin, we could be under wrath. When we repent again, God 
forgive us right away. So I said this, it's not hard to please God when we know that sins are destructive. Immediately we ask God to forgive us. He's happy to forgive us and give us uh, forgiveness and give us strength. Okay, and then, so when we're dead in Christ, God made us alive together with Christ. So if we look at the, uh, the outline here, 